we talked about last week was Godzilla. Week one was Aladdin. So talked about Aladdin last first week. Last week we talked about Godzilla. Today we're going to talk about the Lion King, right? So does anybody know the... There we go. We, we have a few Lion King fans. So the live version is not coming out until July. But uh, I think we kind of know the story, a lot of us. So uh, if you're wondering how I know what I'm talking about when the movie isn't out yet, it's, it's been out for a while. Um, it's a remake. So I want to give you a quick little mini sermon before my message. Because there's a theme that runs through The Lion King that is really, I, I just want to inspire our dads, right? I love, there, there's a scene in The Lion King when uh, little Simba gets in trouble and he has to face his dad, right? And what's neat about that scene, dads, is Simba knows the power his father possesses. And so when he's confronted with his dad, if you remember in the movie, his ears go back and he, and he kind of cowers in fear because his dad could just wipe him out if he wanted. His dad has that kind of power. His dad has that kind of strength. And it's, his dad isn't easy on him. His dad does punish him, but he uses it as a teaching moment. He takes his mistake and he lets Simba learn a lesson from it. Dads, we have all kinds of power. And we have the ability to use or abuse that power. Or we could use that power to bless our children, to speak into their life, to inspire them to be great. So that's the little Father's Day message before we get into the message today. Get, dads, let's inspire our children. Let's inspire them to be all that God has created and destined them to be. That's true power of being a father. Amen? Amen. So that's not what we're going to talk about today. I want to talk to you about the power of community today. Our text comes Philippians, from Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, and it says this, If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to, uh, for you to you soon for a visit, excuse me. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proven himself like a son with his father. He has served me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He's a true brother, a co-worker, and a fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you. And he, has, and he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact... He almost died, but God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I am sending, or so I am, all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be so worried about you. Verse 29, welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy, and give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do. From far away. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the message this morning. I pray that we'd have ears to hear. And Lord, that we'd not only be hearers of the word this morning, but doers in Christ's name. Amen. So the story of the Lion King is about a lion cub prince who is tricked by his treacherous uncle into thinking that he caused his father's death. And he flees into exile and despair, only to learn in adulthood his identity, and his responsibilities. I think that's a great little summation of the story of the Lion King. At the beginning of the story, 
while he's still young, before his father dies, his father's name is Mufasa, Mufasa has some great words to his son. And he says this, he says, everything you see exists together in delicate balance. Everybody say balance. As king, you need to understand that balance, he says, and respect all the creatures from the crawling ant to the leaping antelope. And then he goes on to say, you just heard the quote here, he says, some kings, paraphrasing it, some kings use their power for their good, for their gain. A good king uses his power for the gain, for the good of others. Don't you feel like that's a good description of the church? First of all, that everything that happens, when it's working well, it's in balance. And secondly, that whatever power, whatever influence that we have, we're to leverage that for the good of others. We're not to leverage that for our own good. We're not to leverage that simply for our own comfort and our own well-being, our own welfare. We're here to leverage whatever God gives to us as a community of faith. We're here to leverage that for others. So here we are, we're a mix of people, right, who work best in harmony. We work best, we do best as a community. So we have different personalities, we come from different backgrounds, and, and there are even times, right, that we have different ideas. And we may never, some of us may never hang out together or really have a lot of things in common except for this one thing, we love Jesus, We come together on a Sunday, and we come from different backgrounds, different personalities, different places, all kinds of conglomeration of just different. And then we join together, and we begin to sing, we begin to worship, we begin to serve, we begin to live out this community together in harmony because of our love for Jesus Christ. See, it goes even deeper than that, though, in a way that this film illustrates in a cute way that we're the community of Christ that's been transformed by his love and his mercy. And because of that, we come together and we hang out together every Sunday. It goes even deeper than that, though. In a cute way, we see that we're the community of Christ followers and that we look after each other, even if we might look a little different at times. Some of us look like lions. Some of us look like warthogs. What's Timon? A meerkat. Some of us look like meerkats. I don't know which one I am. I'm going to have to go with warthog. So we look different. We sound different. We come from different backgrounds. We think differently. But we're all joined together in this community of faith by one common denominator, Jesus Christ. And when the church is working right, it becomes a place where our old nature, right? So we all have these backgrounds. And we go, there was this time in our lives where we go, I could never see myself being a part of a church. I could never see myself being in this community. I could never, I could never see myself thinking the way they think or acting the way they think or loving the way they think. So we come with this old self, but we're being transformed. We've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. We've been transformed, and we're being transformed little by little, day by day. And sometimes we regress, and we, go, we, we, make, we make headway, and you know, sometimes we feel like we're farther behind than we should be, but we're, we're changing, and we're being changed. And our old thoughts and our own instincts begin to die. And what happens is we begin to think completely differently, listen, about the people around us. Some of you, you could definitely stand up here if I gave you a mic and you go, man, I'll tell you what, I used to think about church people. And when I used to think about a community of faith, it was totally different than what I think about it today. And what happens is this, is that people who may have never associated with one another before, or people who we thought we would never be friends, suddenly Here's what happens. We become brothers 
and sisters. And we find ourselves, we find ourselves wanting to bring in more and more people to be part of this community that we're a part of. This community of brothers and sisters, this community of different ideas and different personalities and different backgrounds. All of a sudden, we find ourselves wanting to bring people in to be a part of what we found and a part of who we are and a part of what we're becoming. And so what happens is we invite them and then you know what we do? We find a place for them. We find a place for them. Our community becomes a place of two things, love and service, right? Isn't that what we really find here in this community of faith? That we love one another and that as we grow, we're going to talk about this, we serve one another. And the theme that permeates Paul's letter in Philippians is this, sacrificial love and service. So look at, I want you to just check this out, how Paul introduces his, his buddy Timothy. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, right out of the gate, this is how he introduces himself in his letter and to the, the people in Philippians. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. And it's this, this idea of love and service is also played out not only in chapter 1, but you go into chapter 2 and you see it, Paul begins to expand on this. And it's, it's the famous passage there where he talks about Jesus being King of kings and Lord of lords and that Jesus descended from heaven and, and Jesus came to earth, but Jesus didn't just come to earth, earth. He also came to be a slave. Jesus came to serve us. Like, this whole idea that God himself would come down to earth is crazy enough in that, but that God would make himself a slave and that he would humble himself to serve us. Paul's talking about that, that God himself dwelled among us in order to serve us. And he's calling us to this same thing. And this talk of, of servant and service sets the stage for this section of this letter that, we're, that we just read here, where Paul introduces his friends Timothy and Epaphroditus. Everybody say Epaphroditus. you got to say it. You're, you're dying to say it, aren't you? It's one of those names, one of those words, you're just like, is he going to stumble over it? Is he going to mess it up before this service is over? So we've all said it. How many of you nailed it when you said it or you stumbled over a little bit? Yeah? You nailed it, Bob? Look at that, Epaphroditus. <laughs> and you're reading it and you're going, is Pastor Paul really saying it right? I wonder if he is, right? Come on, how many of you are wondering? It's right, folks, okay? I went to school for this. <laughs> yeah, like that means anything, <laughs> right? Anybody here doing what you went to school for? Three people. <laughs> I went to school to graduate. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, Paul, listen, here's what we need to see about this that we're reading. What we're reading is not some kind of dissertation, some theological dissertation. This is a letter from a friend to a group of friends. This is a real person with real problems. Paul is writing this letter from jail. Okay, this is a real man who actually lived and died, and he's in jail. He's got real problems, and he's writing this letter to real people about his feelings and his character, and he's writing to a group of people who have real problems, right, and their own unique character and their own unique issues. And like I said, when Paul wrote this letter, he's sitting in prison. Now, we don't know exactly where Paul is when he's writing this letter, but we do know, what we do know is this, that his friends in Philippi are far away from him. And it's not like, it's not like far away like it is for us where we jump on a plane and fly there, right? There aren't cars. Most people don't even have a donkey to ride on. This is far away. So Paul's this real person with real problems, real issues, is writing to real people in a real place with real problems and real issues. And sometimes I think that we can read Scripture and miss the fact that a lot of these things that are being written are written by real people who are just writing letters. Like Paul isn't expecting his letters to be the Bible someday. So in prison, 
what's happening here is that Paul feels incredible sense of distance. Have you ever been lonely? How many of you are old enough to remember when you were lonely, you sent letters, like real letters, not emails? Is there anybody here that you're like Lori and I, you have a box of those old letters? Right? I'm too embarrassed to go in and read them. So next month will be 28 years that Lori and I, that Lori has had to endure me, I guess is a better way to put it. That's really the most honest way to put it. Like when she said, till death do us part, she did not think it would go this long. I'm pretty sure, right? So you have those box of real letters to real, to somebody that, and some of those letters, you're lonely. You know, I remember in college, there was times, I just, I just read something that they said that college is the, one of the most lonely times, like in your whole lifetime for a lot of people. College, college can be, I never, it makes sense because you kind of go and you're off and you're making a new life and you know how your friends change and everything. And there'd be times I'd write letters to my wife and I'm lonely and I, you know, I, uh, uh, just kind of complaining about it. And now you look back at it, you're like, oh my goodness, I wish that's all I had to worry about, right? And so this is what Paul's doing. He's writing a letter to his friends and he's telling them how he feels. And these are people that Paul's writing to. And when you read the letter of Philippians, Remember that Paul is writing to them because he cares very deeply about them. And so he's writing this letter to try and fix a problem that's going on in their church that he's unable to come in person and be there. As a matter of fact, Philippians, uh, Colossians, Corinthians, Ephesians, these are all letters written exactly for the same reason. There's a mess that's happening in the church, and Paul can't be there, and so he has to write a letter to try and fix and to try to, to kind of parent them as to what's going on. But here's the great thing about this. Not everything's bad, right? Not all things that Paul's going through is bad. What makes this, se- this section that we just read so meaningful is that Paul has his two very good friends that are with him. Timothy, and you want to say the second one with me? Epaphroditus, there you go. Timothy and Epaphroditus are there with Paul. And they've been around with him. And what we see in these verses is that they have served as a connecting point between Paul and the church in Philippi. And from Philippi to Paul. They have blessed him as a friend right there in prison. Boy, don't you wish you had friends like that that would come and be with you even if you were in a Roman prison? And what they've done is they've served as that link, these friends that love Paul so much and love the church in Philippi so much, they've served as a link between Paul and the church in Philippi. So look at how Paul speaks about Timothy as we go on. Verse 19 in chapter 2, if the Lord is willing, and I want you to catch this, we're going to get into the heart of this in just a moment, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit, then he could cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along. Now I want you to catch here, Paul trusts Timothy completely, and he knows that Timothy will represent him well. Now I got to tell you, that's kind of a scary proposition as a pastor. Who would I send, as I was getting this message together this week, I was wondering, who would I send in this situation like that? The church is being ravished by people who are teaching false doctrine. And so Paul says, hmm, of all the people I know, who would I send to go and be my representative to get this church out of this mess? Now think about how completely and totally he must trust Timothy. And he understands that Timothy, part of what Timothy does is that he's going to be an encouragement to those in Philippi. He's going to come and encourage them. And then when he gets things turned around, guess what he's going to do? He's going to bring that word of encouragement back to Paul. Now, he goes on, verses 20 through 23, he says, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. Everybody says care. Think about that. That word that he uses there, he cares about you. I'll expand on that. I want to jump ahead. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself. Like a son with his father, he has served me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. So, as I said, and this is an important piece of background here. 
that Paul is addressing one of the issues in the Philippian church and that they're struggling with. And what was happening is this. There was bad teaching, false teaching, by people who wanted to serve themselves, right? And I don't know how this works in the church world, George, but somewhere in the church world, it's just me and George talking right now, somewhere in the church world, there are these people who all of a sudden want to be powerful. Like their big kingdom in... You know, they want to be a big fish in a little pond. And so all throughout, it's, it's happened all the way back to Paul, Paul's time, first century. And it's happened in churches today where people set themselves up and they want to be important. So, you know, it looks like this in the, in the pastoral world. They have a special parking space with their name on it. Nobody parks here but the pastor or the deacons, Right? Or, or, you know, they have the biggest office, or they have the best this, or they have the best that. Um, I've even gone, have, have you ever visited churches where, you know, they have like entourages that go around? You know, Jill's, was that you? You had the entourage, or you saw? <laughs> Jill's entourage. You know, you go into those churches, and you're like, wow, right? And Paul says, not only are these people puffing themselves up, their motivation is wrong. Okay, but from wrong motivation comes wrong teaching, right? And so Paul says, we're going to send Timothy to fix this. There were people at work in that community that were trying to gain power and authority over everyone else. Always guard against that church. Can I, can I tell that to you? When I leave as your pastor 100 years from now, so I'm not making any announcements, can I tell you something? That's the vacuum where it happens. Right? Remember these words. Okay? Write it down someplace. Pastor Paul said, watch the vacuum. And that's what happened. Paul left, and there was the vacuum. And these folks came right in, and they began to fill the vacuum by trying to fill some need in their own life by taking control of other people. That's how it works, right? And so Paul says, whoa, 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 guys, 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 guys. Things were working well. We had it going well. The community was serving one another, and things were, go back to what? So I'm going to send Timothy. He's going to be my emissary, and he's going to set things right again. He wanted them to work as a community. So he sends his two friends, Timothy and Epaphroditus, to correct the problem. And in these two friends, here's what we're going to see. We're going to see some great, wonderful ingredients for true community. So the first person, obviously, we've been talking about already is Timothy. Timothy isn't sent to Philippi because Timothy's the best leader that's ever, ever been on the face of the planet. Timothy's young. Timothy, we, we read about Timothy in the book, the two books, First and Second Timothy. We understand that he's still immature and he's got some rough edges, right? So it isn't because of his great credentials and it isn't because he's such a great te teacher. It isn't because he's read all of John Maxwell's leadership books, right? He, and it's not that, it's not even that Timothy is more skilled than the people that are there. As a matter of fact, the guys who probably come in and gain control of the church probably were very skilled at what they did. The one qualification that made Timothy the right person, the perfect person for this job was his character. It was his character. Paul knew that Timothy was trustworthy. He knew that Timothy had a servant's heart. He knew that Timothy was completely unselfish. And he knew that Timothy's interests were not for himself, but that his interests were for that of Jesus Christ. Timothy lived his life completely and absolutely in contrast to those people that had come in to Philippi and had taken over that church. And it's the character of Timothy that makes him qualified to deal with the problem and the situation there in the city of Philippi. See, the people that were there, they were out for their own gain and their own advantage. Timothy, listen, Timothy was all about Jesus and only Jesus. And when we're about Jesus, you know what happens? We say, God, Jesus, you be glorified. And I want to fade into the background. Everything I do, I want you to be seen, not for me to be seen. I want you to be the one that's famous, 
not me. So Paul knew that that was the heart of Timothy. And that's why he sent him. So some of the, the examples of community is Paul's friend Timothy. His second example of community is his friend Epaphroditus. Now, we know quite a bit about Timothy. I mean, there's two books that have his name, right? And we know that Paul had sent these letters to Timothy. So we've got a pretty good idea of Timothy. We know things like Timothy's mother's name. We know what uh, area, what town, and what community and church Timothy comes from. We know quite a bit about Timothy. But Epaphroditus, we don't know anything about it at all. As a matter of fact, this is the only place in the Bible that we read about Epaphroditus. So we know nothing about his background, except that he comes out of the church of Philippi, that he was sent to Paul from them. And so Timothy and Epaphroditus provide the perfect set of gifts for this hurting church. In Timothy, we see someone who embodies truth in a beautiful way. Timothy just doesn't know the truth of Jesus. Timothy absolutely lives out the truth of Jesus. If Timothy embodies truth, then perhaps we could say that Epaphroditus embodies love. He embodies love. Specifically, he represents Paul's love for the Philippians. And so Timothy and Epaphroditus give us a beautiful example of what it looks like to foster community. So we're going to dig into this here this morning. Timothy, they embody these two ingredients, and if you haven't written them down in your notes, go ahead and write them down in your notes. Timothy, love, Epaphroditus, excuse me, Timothy, truth, Epaphroditus, love. So let's look at Epaphroditus, and we're going to build on this, and how he demonstrates strong Christian love. See, Epaphroditus seems to be uh, sent to Paul by the Philippian church, right? They were concerned about Paul's condition, they hear that he's in prison, and it's not like prison that we know today, even the bad prisons that we know today would still be a a hotel compared to what Paul probably was in, in a Roman jail. Usually a Roman jail, well, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have any floor, it was mud. When you went to the bathroom, you did it in that room. You didn't get one hour, you didn't even get one hour break to go outside of that room, you were in that room, and most of the time, you were chained either to the wall, or you were chained to a Roman soldier. For the day. So we see in other places that Paul had talked about those poor guys who got chained to him. Because all he did was talk about Jesus to them. (laughs) Well, your name's John. John, I have a story to tell you. Looks like we have time, (laughs) right? So these places weren't, weren't nice places. And so the Philippians see that Paul's in jail, and they love him so much that they send, it looks like they send Epaphroditus to ease Paul's suffering right there in prison. So they sent him to take care of Paul, listen, on their behalf. So if, as we believe that he was in the prison in Caesarea, right, that means that the journey from Philippi took more than a month to get to where Paul was, by ship. That's how long uh, Epaphroditus had to travel just to get there to Paul, which means that this was no small commitment of time and no small commitment of money. We know that it was a challenging journey because, listen, Paul tells us in his letter that Epaphroditus became so ill that he almost died. That's commitment to get so ill that you almost die and you still go to be with him. How many of you would have just turned around and gone home? Go back to my bed. I don't need this. This is way too much. Obviously, God's not calling me to do this. Right? How many of us, come on, you don't have to, do not raise your hand, because this is how we judge God's, God's will for us, right? If I get uncomfortable, it's not God's will. Right? How many of you have been on a diet? The first meal, you're actually hungry. You're like, no, God doesn't want me to do this. If people are raising their hands, yeah, it's me, right? Obviously, God doesn't want me to suffer. Epaphroditus almost died, and he still, he still finished his mission to get to Paul and to encourage him. So the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to Paul to encourage him. Now, after he's been there for a while, Paul is sending Epaphroditus back 
to the Philippians in order to encourage them. So this letter that we're reading, how cool is this? This letter was probably carried by Epaphroditus from the Apostle Paul from a prison, probably at Caesarea, all the way back to the Philippian church. Pretty neat when you think about the historical context of all of this. So, look how Paul introduces Epaphroditus in verse 25. This is pretty cool. And it's going to matter here in a moment, if I can find it. What's he say? He says, he calls him my brother, my fellow worker, and a fellow soldier. Now, these are fascinating words. Brother, worker, soldier. Bible scholars point out that each of these words in the original Greek language holds deep meaning. We know, right, brother, worker, eh, soldier, right? And each one is deeper than the one before. Paul is purposely building on this idea, right? So he uses these descriptions to build on each other. Paul is using them intentionally. Each of these words serves as a great picture of how the community of Christ followers can grow deeper in, her, in him. So the first one is my brother's in your note. My brother Epaphroditus. Brother is, brother is, did someone say how to spell brother? B-R-O. T-H-E-R. I heard, how do you spell that? B-R-O. <laughs> okay. Paul loves to use the word brother, right? It's an inclusive word. I have four of them. I have four brothers, right? So, like, there's deep connection between me and my brothers. And Paul is letting, in the same way, Paul is letting the Philippian church and the Christians there know that he has a deep connection with them. That it's a connection that goes deeper than just the fact that we share the same faith. They have a heart connection with one another. We're brothers. They know each other. They have worshiped together. They have experienced God together. Your siblings, you have experiences that only you have. Nobody else knows what it's like to have grown up in the Allen home. Only me and my four brothers. There's things, there's vacations, there's, there's life ups and downs that only my brothers and I have that connection to. And Paul's saying that we as believers to the Philippians church, he said, it doesn't say it's to every church, but to this church, you all have, we have these stories, we have these backgrounds, we have these things that only we share. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm sending my brother, your brother, our brother, Epaphroditus, back to you. If you were to put that in the context of brothers and sisters today, they are the fellow Christians that we see regularly, right? The people that we worship with. Hey, uh, uh, even smaller microcosm of, a, of this might be your community group that you meet with. Like, there's that connection that goes deeper than just, you know, the people we know. There's people that you see, and, and I, I meet people all the time, and they, I go to this church, oh, well, I'm at Shoreline Community Church, and, and we're brothers and sisters, but we don't have the co same connection that I have here with you all. And then there's an even deeper connection that I have with those that I meet with on Tuesday night at my community group, or a, at your Bible study, or when, when the ladies get together, or the men get together, there's just something that's, and Paul's saying that it goes deeper than that. Epaphroditus is my brother. He's your brother. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We share this. We are a part of one another. And when you think about the people here at Shoreline Community Church that you spend time with every week in God's presence, or the Christians in a wider global context, you know people probably all around the world. You've met missionaries here that have come, and you know other people that have left Brantford, or you've gone to other churches, you've worshipped in Florida for a while, and, and you know different ones that they're your, we've gone on missions trips together with them uh, in Haiti, and they become your brothers and sisters. That's what we become brothers and sisters. We share this experience. But Paul builds on this and he goes even deeper and he talks about Epaphroditus as a fellow worker. In the King James Version, it's a fellow laborer. Have you ever worked a day, I mean really worked a day with somebody? When we would go out every so often, we'd be asked to come and help out on the farm and we'd go and do hay. Has anybody ever put in hay 
That is the hardest day's work you can imagine. That and laying block is just like ridiculous. You, you sleep well after you've put hay in for a day. And there's something about that, that commonality of doing something, building something, putting something together with other people. You start out, you can start out as complete strangers, but by the end of the day, you're a fellow worker. You look at that and you, you look around this building. How many of us, we came and we painted together and we, we tore down walls together and we put other walls back up and, and we laid blocks and we, we look at this and we go, you know what, me and Darren, we, we, we did this part of it, right? Every so often, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I love, I go into my, the restroom in my office and Glory scraped the wall there. And I think about Glory, like, wow, you know, not that we shared the bathroom, you know, she totally, I just want to make sure it's completely appropriate. And not one time did I go in that bathroom while she was in that bathroom, okay? That is on tape and that is true, okay? But we share in like, I look around and I see different projects that, that Dave, when you go out in that foyer and those smooth walls, they weren't smooth. Dave, for a month, went and smoothed out that wall. We're fellow laborers. Like this, this place, we did this together. We built this. This is blood, sweat, and tears. This is more than just, just I gave money and it happened. This is, this is I gave money, but then I also gave him myself. And, and we... There's literally blood, sweat, and tears in here. We dug that trench together. We are fellow laborers. It goes, there's a deeper connection there. It's not simply about our personal faith connection. It's about serving together. And Paul and Epaphroditus did exactly that. They didn't just hang out. They, they worked together. They served as partners in a mission. Epaphroditus didn't just watch, listen to me, Epaphroditus didn't just watch from the stands. He got on the playing field. He was in the game. And when Paul thinks about Epaphroditus, here's what happens. He can't help but think of all that they had accomplished together. He can't help but look back at the different places where they had served together, the different places that they had ministered together, and the different places that they had preached together. And he goes, Epaphroditus is part of what God has done. Part of the, the ministry that we are here today is a direct result of Paul. But guess what? It wasn't just Paul. It was Timothy, and it was Epaphroditus, and it was Barnabas, and there were so many different ones. And Epaphroditus is part of that, is what Paul's saying. He's my fellow laborer. The church exists in 2021 today because of Epaphroditus. He's part of the legacy and the foundation of the church. They had made a dent in the kingdom of darkness, and together they were used by God to change the world. Boy, isn't there a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction when you work together and have that kind of a relationship? So Paul says, Epaphroditus, you're my fellow worker, you're my brother. But the final word that Paul uses to describe Epaphroditus is fellow soldier. Now, I've never served, but I can't imagine what it's like to be in a foxhole with somebody or to be on a ship with a group of, of men and women. And to serve together in the midst of a battle. Been in a couple of scrapes in my life. And had somebody bigger come and help me out. Right? Been in a couple of fights with people. And, you know, there's that sense. But I can't imagine what it's like to be a soldier. And so here, Paul borrows some imagery. And he takes this fellow worker analogy. And he takes it one step further. And Paul thinks about all that they've been through together. And how Epaphroditus was willing to sacrifice even his life to make ministry happen. See, we can be brothers and sisters, right? And we can lose contact with one another. We can be fellow workers, and when the job's done, we kind of walk away sometimes. But can I tell you something? This deeper level is when we're in the fight, we're in the fight until the battle's over. We are shoulder to shoulder. We're back to back. We're arm in arm. Whatever it takes, we're going to prevail. That's what Paul's saying that Epaphroditus is to him. And Epaphroditus, I love this. Epaphroditus loved Paul so much that he said, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care how long it takes. And I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to go and be with my fellow soldier in arms Paul. 
See, that's what friends, that's what real friends, that's what real brothers, that's what real fellow laborers, that's what soldiers do for one another. No matter what happens, no matter how this ends, I'm going to be there. And if I don't make it, I don't make it. But if I do, here's what Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was thinking. See, I did mess it up. He's thinking, even if I don't make it, or even if it doesn't end well, I'm going to be there and I'm going to spread the gospel with Paul. As a fellow soldier, he was willing to lay his life down for Paul and for the gospel. It's an amazing illustration of true community. You remember in The Lion King? Remember when Simba had to go back to fight his uncle Scar? He didn't say anything to Timon and Pumbaa, did he? He just left. And then they meet Rafiki, right? I love Rafiki too. Okay. They meet Rafiki and he tells them where Simba has gone. And what do they do? They go to fight alongside of their brother. Why? Because they were more than friends. They were fellow soldiers in the battle. And if it mattered to Simba, and for Epaphroditus, if it mattered to Paul, then he wanted to be there. He wanted to fight side by side with him. And this is the final description of Epaphroditus. And what it does is it reminds us that at the center of community, church is sacrifice. We're all fellow soldiers fighting a battle. We're all here. We're in this battle together. And if we fight together, then we're going to be effective for God. So we have to be prepared to lay down our lives for one another. See, it's one thing to like each other. It's another thing to be willing to come and, and bring a dish for a pot roast dinner, right? And we can feel a connection on that level. It's another thing to step out and serve together, working for God. And when we take it even to the next level, that we become fellow soldiers in the trenches together, our concept of community, listen, it changes and it becomes deeper. See, there are times when we experience that ourselves. So I want to show you just a quick video this morning that Bob put together of a time here, just last year, that a group from our church went out and served together. It was our missions trip last year in Houston. Here's just a quick video of that. I'm going to invite the worship team to join me up here. So the challenge for us today is to walk out our journey of Epaphroditus. For some of us, listen, for some of us, we need to move from being observers of the community to embrace the people that we're in community with. We need to embrace one another as brothers and sisters. And here's what that means. That means it may mean that some of us need to take, can we turn this front light on? Some of us need to take the first step towards membership. And the first step towards membership, for some of us, listen, don't, don't look at them, okay? Everybody's, bring it back to me, because I, it has a point this morning. Some of us, we need to stop referring to SCC as your church. 
start referring to it as our church. That's the first step. This is my church. It's our church. I'm here and I belong here. These are my brothers and sisters. And that's a very significant decision to embrace. Because what we're really embracing is this community of believers. And we see ourselves as a, that we're on a journey together. It's not Pastor Paul and Lori's journey. It's not the deacon's journey. It's not their journey. It's our journey. We're going someplace together. Others of us need to embrace this community as our family. And there's room to grow. Right? And for uh, some of us, that challenge is to get involved. Right? And to take our involvement to another level as fellow workers. A great analogy of that is the dinner table. Right? At the dinner table, the family and the guest both share the same meal. Right? What's the difference between family and guest? After the dinner's done, the family cleans up and does uh, They do the dishes. For some of us, it means that we need to begin to not see ourselves as a guest at the table, but we actually need to get up and help with the dishes. There's things that we can do. There's things that we can get involved in. There's areas where we can serve. And while it's appropriate to be a guest for a while, there comes a point where it's time to do the dishes. Perhaps God has laid a place on your heart to be involved. Can I tell you how God lays that on your heart? When you look at something in the church and you go, man, somebody should do something about that. Guess who that person is? God's laid it on your heart. Why doesn't anybody ever see that this isn't getting done? Guess who's the right person for that job? You. God's laying it. God's putting a burden on your heart. That's how God does it. Maybe you see it, but you just haven't dared to get involved yet. Can I tell you a couple of areas where we have openings right now here at Shoreline? Our Splash Kids ministry has openings. We would love to expand that into our 11 o'clock. We can't grow our 11 o'clock because we don't have enough people yet to expand our kids' programs. Our 11 o'clock would really blossom. And we've asked people in the past about stay one, serve one. Staying and getting fed in one service. That's why we have two. And then you could serve in the second one. Splash Kids is one. Another area we're about to expand, we have one person right now serving at our connection table, and that's Jane Laprino. One person for all the guests that we have come week after week. She can't even be here for both services a lot of times because she has things to do too. Maybe you're, you don't see yourself as the most outgoing person. You don't have to be the most outgoing person. You really don't. Say, wow, I would love to see somebody help out there. Someone should probably do something. Maybe that's you. We're going to expand that connection table and how we follow up with our guests. I don't know what that was. But we're going to expand that. That's an opening we have right now. If you are interested in that, see Jane. Go ahead, wave. That's Jane. Our small group leaders. Our small groups have just come to an end. We're taking the summer off, and we're going to start small groups in the fall. Maybe you're interested in doing that. Not just going to a small group, but leading a small group. Maybe hosting a small group at your house. Jill's is going to be overseeing that. Go ahead and wave. Jill's is your guy to talk to. And we'll be expanding that with Jill's. Media. See Mikey back there? He's not the guy to talk to. Megan is. But you know what? Maybe you say, you know what? I know a little bit about computers. You don't need to know a lot. Actually, everything's set up for you. You come in on Sundays, it's ready to go. Almost always. We have glitches here and there, but we'll help you out. But if you could press a button, you could do media. If you could press a button and pay attention, because you got to pay attention. That's a big part of it. Right, Maria? If you, Megan's not here yet. If you want to see Maria, you can talk to Maria about that. But these are great places. And our lights. We've got two young ladies who do it, two sisters. And if they're not here, we just leave them on one setting. Isn't it nice blue? Looks good. 
These are immediate areas where maybe you say, wow, you know what? I just didn't know there was some area to serve. Can you consider yourself asked? These are areas where you could step up and say, you know what? It's our church. I need to help out with the dishes. Perhaps God is nudging some of us to move into a little bit deeper waters, right? For the sake of the gospel. For ministry, for church ministry. Maybe God's calling you into maybe not full-time, but part-time church ministry. And that, that's, that's serving in a deeper level. You're saying, wow, God, what would that look like? Let us know. We've got places where you could serve. And start working that out. Brothers and sisters, fellow workers, the final challenge is for us to become soldiers. That's the deep level, right? Maybe you say, I see what is going on around the world. I see what's happening, and I need to go into a deeper spot. Maybe that is full-time ministry for you. Maybe, especially our young people, God's calling you into, and, and can I say maybe it's for our older folks too. You get to a place where you retire, or you get to a place where you're comfortable enough to retire, and you say, wow, you know what? Maybe God's calling me to, there's all kinds of ministries that you could serve in. Maybe your whole life you said, I was at work and I had my family and I just wasn't able to do that, but now I'm in a place in my life that I could do that. Can I ask you something? Here's the question for you this morning. What's God calling you to surrender? What's God calling you to surrender? Is He calling you to surrender at this place where you've just kept everything at arm's length and you need to embrace as brothers and sisters? Maybe you've come and you've enjoyed everything and everybody serving you, but it's time for you to help out with the dishes, to get your hands dirty, to put a little bit of sweat equity into what happens. Maybe that's even financial equity. It's another side of that. Say, God, what would you have me do? And maybe, maybe there's some of you that you'd say, this needs to be a full-time thing for me. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I know I've been a little long this morning, and I apologize. God, I pray over your church this morning. I pray that wherever you're calling us to go deeper, that we would say yes. Lord, that we wouldn't fight it, that we wouldn't make excuses, but Lord, we would just simply say yes. Take that next step into deeper relationship with you and into deeper, see, we take our deeper relationship with you and we take a deeper relationship with our community. So God, I pray this Father's Day that in the same way that Simba had to embrace his destiny, him and his pals, they went and they changed a community. They restored it. God, I pray that we would restore our community as we live in community as we serve one another, and by serving one another, we serve you. God, I pray that we not just wrestle with this, but that we would do. We'd not just be hearers, we'd be doers today, I pray in the name of Jesus. Philippians, Paul writing to the Philippians, this is how he closes out his letter to them. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I pray that for you this week. We're going to sing one last song this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. For Father's Day, we want to declare that our Heavenly Father is a good Father. Amen?